This online training is designed for teachers who are new to delivering international GCSE physics specification. The training comprises of three standalone modules which are booked separately and this module, this session, focuses on teaching the course and hopefully will give you an understanding of the content of the qualification and how to cover it and something about course and lesson planning. In the second session, which happens tomorrow at the same time, um, it's looking spe specifically at understanding the assessment and preparing students for it, and also a brief overview of support from Pearson that's available to te teachers online. Let's have a look at the outline. Okay. I appear to have lost vision of the chat at the moment, which is a shame. Hi, Keith. If you need Hi. to get the chat back up while you're sharing screen, if you scroll your mouse cursor to the top of your share screen options. And when the little drop down bar appears, there should be the option to get the chat. Yeah. Can you see it? I can. I clicked it, but it's not appearing on my screen, which is a bit of a shame, but um, I'm, I'm not, not sure why. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it was just slow to respond. I apologize. Thank you for that. No worries. Keith, just to let you know, I've had a request for captions to be enabled for this meeting uh, because there are some who uh, obviously would prefer the captions just so that they can read along while they hear you. Yeah, just I have no problem with that. OK. Yeah. And I, I think the caption sort of auto converts my speech into into text. Um, I warn everyone that I grew up in Sheffield, which means I have a different English accent and sometimes uh, sp you know, speak your word machines uh, don't always interpret my words entirely right. And I do apologize for that. Let's have a go. Okay, let's look at what we're doing. During this session, we're going to look at how the qualifications are arranged, to review the content of the qualification, to explore how to plan the course and lessons. And then as I say, going on in future sessions, we'll look at understanding the assessment of the qualification and how to prepare students for that, and to look at some support that's available from Pearson. Let's start. Okay. We're the world's leading learning company, and as the UK's largest awarding organisation, best place, we believe, to provide qualifications that are aligned to the British educational system. Our heritage stretches back over 150 years, and together we partner with schools, universities and employers worldwide, offering world-class, global, globally recognised qualifications to over 3.5 million students a year. We're the trusted and recognised qualifications partner to, to over six and a half thousand schools, colleges and employers across the world. We mark over 10 million exam scripts on behalf of the UK Department for Education each year, and we operate in 70 countries worldwide. Some of this is just a basic introduction to people who are new to Pearson, because this is intended, really, this course, for people who are new to delivering the international spec. And you might be new for a number of reasons. It may be that your school or your centre has just taken up this specification. It may be that you as a teacher have just changed school and you're now working in a school which is teaching this specification. Or you might actually be new to teaching yourself. And all of those are valid reasons for you to be joining this Welcome to Pearson session. Let's have a look at an overview of the specification and how it's assessed. The specification is the main document that you need to teach the course. Um, the specification and the sample assessment materials are the documents which are downloadable, as we've explained at the beginning. So you can download them or you can access them directly uh, from the Pearson website. The specification is the main document and it outlines the aims of the course, the content that you must cover and all the information that you need about um, assessing your students. There are also sample assessment materials and when a specification starts it's really useful because it gives examples of the type of question papers and what the questions will look like. It's really useful at the start of a specification. This specification has been running for several years now and so we have a number of live papers, uh, exam papers which have already been used and so it's arguable that the real papers become a more important resource than the sample assessment materials in the situation.
using the specification. Content is arranged as eight topics. As a minimum, all the bullet points in the content must be taught. The word including in the content helps to specify the detail of what it is that must be covered. Examples. Throughout the content, we've included examples of what could be covered or what might support teaching and learning. It's important to note in these cases that centres can use other examples. Practical investigations are included as specification points in italics, and I'll show you that an example of that in a moment. And referencing. Specification statements that are bold with a P reference relate to content that's only in the International GCSE in Physics, not the Combined Science Double Award. So this is a page from the content section. As you can see, it's from the magnetism uh, area. And if I, I think if I click a couple more times, you will see arrows. Here you go. You'll see that um, as the practical investigation is identified in italics, for example, 6.6 .6 there is a practical investigation. And the items 6.9p, 6.10p, 6.11p are all um, areas which appear in the physics only, the single science physics, not in the double award science, the combined science. So the two areas are distinguished in that way within the specification. We're the only exam board to offer the choice of modular or linear routes for students taking international GCSE qualifications. If you're happy with the linear approach, there's absolutely no pressure to move to the modular route. The linear international GCSEs will continue to be offered and they're taken widely by students around the world. However, and this is a relatively new um, uh, option, if you believe the modular route will be a benefit to your existing students and could help you to attract more prospective families to your school, we can support you in moving to a modular route for your selection of subjects. You can see in the uh, modular route, unit assessments can be taken over multiple exam series and grades are calculated on raw marks, which are then converted to a uniform mark scale. Students can resit individual units in any exam series and once a student has all their unit results, they can cash in those results for their grade. In the more traditional linear route, assessments for all units are taken together in one exam series, and grades are calculated on the raw marks only. Students can re sorry, can resit assessments for all units together in one exam series, so you can resit the whole lot, you can't resit individual parts. And the grade that students receive are calculated at the end of the exam series in which they sat their assessments. If we have a closer look at what's in the two papers, the modular and linear approach contact uh, the same content, but the modular approach breaks the journey into two units with an exam at the end of each unit. If you're already offering Pearson Edexcel International GCSE Linear, this will continue to be offered and remain exactly as it is at the moment. So students who are taking the linear approach will have studied all the content before the exam so our linear specification is structured in a way where all the topics can be assessed in both exam papers. Exams on both routes contain a mixture of different question styles, and that includes multiple choice questions, short answer questions, calculations, and extended open response questions. It says in documentation that a calculator may be used in the examinations, but as a teacher myself, I would strengthen that to say a calculator must be used. It's essential that you encourage your students to use a scientific calculator and one that they're familiar with in all of the physics exams, or they will be seriously disadvantaging themselves. You can see that the topics that are included uh, are forces and motion, electricity, waves, energy resources and energy transfer, solids, liquids and gases, magnetism and electromagnetism, radioactivity and particles, and astrophysics. The linear paper one is a two hour written exam. Modular examinations are one hour, 40 minute written examinations for each one. Looking at paper two, 
The linear is a one hour, 15 minute written exam. And again, the mod modular papers are one hour, 40 minutes. You can see how the breakdown of marks is slightly different between the two uh, routines. And the linear paper two assesses all of the content, including content that is in bold and has a C prefix. So in other words, including that material, which is at students who are doing the single science physics. Again, questions may come from any topic area across the specifications, the eight uh, topics that I just outlined. Bold statements cover some topics in greater depth. Once again, the spec says a calculator may be used in the examinations, and as I say, I would strengthen that to say, make sure your students have one. You may want to change the way you teach the international GCSE chemistry specification content if you take the modular route for assessment. And to support your planning and teaching of the course, uh, we're producing course planners, editable schemes of work, and getting started guides. First teaching for international GCSE physics on the modular route is this coming September 2024. And the first assessment of international GCSE physics. Sorry, first assessment is on May or June, so summer of next year, 2025. These have been worked on currently, and as soon as they're available, they'll be uploaded to the relevant qualification specific uh, website. About a little note about resits for the modular international GCSE. Learners can resit any unit, irrespective of whether the qualification is to be cashed in. If a learner resits a unit more than once, only the better of the two most recent attempts at that unit will be available for aggreg aggregation to a qualification grade. Results of units will be held in Pearson Ed Excel's unit bank for as many years as this specification remains available. Once international GCSE in chemistry, uh, the modular chemistry has been uh, cert certificated, all unit results are deemed to be used up, to, up, up at that level. These results can't be used again towards a further award of the same qualification at the same level. It might just hit my doorbell. Excuse That's just me. because the parcel is being delivered. Okay, yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, I think it's someone just letting me know that they've got a parcel at the front door. Hello, Keith, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear. Uh, I have a question. If, is, is it all right if I ask it right now or shall I wait? Uh, yeah, 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 go for it. Okay, uh, the question is that, uh, is there a duration in which the modular has to be covered? Like, for example, for linear, we have to cover it in like one or two goes. But for the modular, is it like two years, four years, five years, like a certain duration in which the student has to cover? I'm not sure uh, what the timing out is. I'll, I'd have to refer you to the specification itself. I think because they can reset, but there's kind of, um, there's a sell-by date on the module. So to say, if they, I, I don't think you can carry on holding on to them indefinitely, but I'm not sure what that length is. I, um, I'm, as I say, that's just being developed at the moment. So I'd have to refer you to the um, subject advisor, Irene, and I'll give you contact details for her later. Uh, I'm not Great. actually sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay. I'm going to start with a quick question, an activity. I'm going to invite you to answer this in the um, in the chat. OK, I mean, there are about 20 of us on this call. And if we all try and answer orally, it's going to sound like we're in a washing machine, I'm afraid. So I'm going to invite you to answer this in, in, in the chat. Here's the question. What's on screen there is part of a question from paper two. And the question is, what parts of the content, which specification points are being assessed? So you'll need to refer to your specification, the one you've just downloaded or the one you already have to be able to answer this. Which part of the content, which specification point, you only have to put the number of the specification point or points are being assessed. So here's the question. Two students use this method to investigate sound from a moving source. Student A connects a piece of string to a buzzer. She spins round so that the buzzer moves in a horizontal circular path. She spins round at a slow speed and then spins round at a high speed. Student B stands several metres away from student A. OK, so you can see what's happening here. The sound heard by student A is different to the sound heard by student B. 
discuss the differences in the sounds heard by student A and student B. Okay, be clear, I'm not asking you to answer this question, but rather to put in the chat, which specification point do you think is being assessed here? I'll stay quiet for a moment or two while you have a look at your specification and type your answer into the meeting chat. Okay, I don't disagree with you, Dep Mohammed, but it's probably easier if you put the number in there, but you're absolutely right. Okay, you, you, okay. so uh, which specification point is that? We've had a first bid. Any other suggestions? Any more for any more? Any more bids for a specification point? Okay, I'm going to jump in. It's most closely related to topic three, waves. And actually, specification point 3.8. 3.8 says, explain why there is a change in the observed frequency and wavelength of a wave when its source is moving relative to an observer, and that this is known as the Doppler effect. So absolutely bang on. That's what that question is asking about. The source is moving relative, at least to student B, and so they hear a different uh, sound when it's swinging towards them than they do from when it's swinging away. But as Mohammed actually correctly said when he put his words in right at the beginning there, it's, he could also argue that it's related to topic eight, astrophysics, because the top Doppler effect also comes up in 8.15, 8.15p, says, describe that if a wave source is moving relative to an observer, there'll be a change in the observed frequency and wavelength. And obviously in that case, related to light waves, you know, redshift as opposed to the sound waves that we're seeing. So you could argue that the question could be tackling both specification point 3.8 and 8.15. It's not really a trick question. The example does come from paper two, it said that on screen, which means that either specification point could be being addressed. Remember paper one only assesses those specification points which are not in bold, those which are in both double award and separate sciences, while paper two assesses all content. So actually this question could be assessing 3.8 or 8.15. Well done, clap yourself on the back if you got either of those. Okay. What I'd like you to do now is choose one topic or part of a topic from the physics specification, one of the eight, eight topics, or even a part of the, each of the, one of the topics, and plan the order in which you would teach that topic. Okay, uh, so, and, and again, this is an answer that I'd want you to put in the, in the meeting chat, please. In other words, you don't have to write out a complete terms teaching plan, obviously. I just want you to put down uh, what what you'd start with, what you'd do next, what you, you know, so which part of the topic would you start with, what would you move on, what would you move on to next? Obviously, there are some things that you need to teach before others, so that because students are building their knowledge on earlier, you know, so there, there is a definite order to teach things, but um, 
there isn't just one order. So I want you, you to choose a topic. It can be any of the topics and say, what would you start with? What would you do next? What would you move on to? And if you put that in the uh, chat, we'll have a discussion about that in a few minutes. Once again, I'll stay quiet for a few minutes whilst uh, whilst you do that. I guess it will probably be obvious from your answer, but you might need to specify which topic it is you're talking about in your answer so it's clear which topic you're giving the order for. So great, May has um, um, demonstrated exactly what, what I'm looking you for, uh, looking for. So May has suggested topic three waves and labeled what, what order would tackle that topic in, starting with properties of waves, then looking at light and sound, then the electromagnetic spectrum. I'll stay quiet for a bit longer whilst other people put in their suggestions. probably should have reminded you, um, as Sriva did at the beginning of the session, that when you're sending these answers, you need to make sure that the two is to everyone so that other people can see the answers. Otherwise, we can't call this a discussion, really. You need to be able to see uh, other people's answers, too. So remember when you're sending a message to that you make it to everyone. And then when you're looking at other people's answers, you can just use the scroll bar on the right to scroll back through other people's answers and see what they've put to. So we've had suggestions on uh, the waves topic, density. Um, students can be taught about common properties of waves before teaching sound and light. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of agreeing with what May said there, I think. Density and pressure, which, which order would you teach those in? Yes, I think so would I. I would teach density and then pressure. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you for those contributions. And do please keep adding them in. I'm not cutting you off halfway through. I just want to, to, to move us on. Um, the point I want to make, really, is I was hoping, and I'm really pleased that no one has, you wouldn't just say, or follow it as it is in the scheme of work or follow it as it is in the specification because all this, although the specification is laid out in a kind of logical order it's not intended to be the the necessary teaching order you don't have to teach topics in the order in which they appear in the specification or the order in which they appear in the online scheme of work or the order in which they appear in the textbook that you're using okay 
uh, it's, what you do need to do is think about which order to teach them in. And that might differ from one cohort of students to another. If you know your students, if you taught them previously, you know what their background knowledge is. If you don't already know them, or even if you do, it's sometimes useful to start a new topic by doing a kind of brainstorm with the students and finding out what students already know, what their misconceptions are, what they know, what they need to know, you know, perhaps by getting them to draw a mind map or something. But, you know, it, it thrashes out what they already know and gets them thinking about the topic. And that can often lead into a sensible um, order of teaching the topics. You don't have to follow the order in which they are in the specification. The scheme of work that's published on the website, which we we'll mention, uh, does it in the order of the specification. But as I say that's not necessarily the best way in which to teach it. You have to decide for yourself what you're going to teach first, what will come next. And that's a definite decision to be made. Obviously, some things have to follow others because students need to know some building blocks before they can build on to uh, knowing the follow on information. But you do need to consider it and consider it in the light of your students and what you know about them. Thank you for that. How to prepare students in practical skills. This comes from the um, from the specification. The best way to develop experimental skills is to embed practical investigations in teaching or theory. The development of knowledge and experimental skills can then happen together, leading to secure acquisition of both knowledge and skills. I have known teachers who taught in schools where they've perhaps had five lessons of physics a week, let's say, and they might have a double on Monday afternoon and three singles, and they'll say, okay, we'll do all our practicals on Monday afternoon when we have the double lesson. And they religiously plow through doing practicals on Monday afternoon, whether or not they're in any link to the topics that they're teaching in the single lessons. And I understand the practical reasons for that, but I think it's a mistake in terms of developing the student's understanding. It's much more useful if students are doing experiments alongside the theory that they're learning and sometimes as a way of learning that theory so that they develop the understanding together seeing the concrete examples in the practical situation in the experiments and understanding the theory that goes along with them at the same time our practical investigations are embedded within section two physics content as specification points in italics as i demonstrated earlier and the skills that are developed through these and other practicals will be assessed through the written exams there are also practical activities in the appendix, and I do encourage students to have as much practical, um, practical experience in the laboratory as they can. Uh, it, it does definitely show in students' answers in questions if they've experienced the situation they're answering in, in practical experimental um, settings. And equally, it shows when students haven't had any practical experience, but they don't fully understand what the situation is. Here's an example screenshot of part of the specification content in Unit 6, Magnetism. And you can see how it shows the practical investigation here at point 6.6, .6, identified in italics within the content. Here's a list of the areas which students might be tested on in the assessment of practical skills. OK, the slide's quite dense, I know, but it's not necessary for you to read it out completely in detail. The point I'm trying to make is that students might be tested on a wide range of aspects of experimental skills. And it'll be important for us as teachers to include within our planning lots of time and activities to develop these skills. It's an area which is often downplayed in favour of covering all the content. And with this slide, I'm hopefully emphasising that to do so, not to give practical skills the time that they deserve, can be a costly error in terms of students' ability to achieve well in the exam. So all of the things listed on the slide there are things which students may be tested on related to think, um, skills they've developed during experimental activities. Here on the screen are some collected summary, sorry, collated summary comments from the examiner's reports on papers one and two in the summer 2019 series. Each time there's a series of exams, the chief examiner prepares a report indicating how students did on individual questions, where students went wrong, where students did well, a really good analysis of how students have done on the individual bits of the paper. And examiners have noticed these things. 
most students were able to recall the equations and usually they handled the related calculations well. Successful candidates were competent in performing quantitative work, could recall relevant formulae and rearrange those formulae to obtain the correct answer. Students who gave the best practical descriptions showed evidence of undertaking all the required practicals themselves and could produce detailed, coherent methods whilst recalling the relevant uh, results of these experiments. Less successful candidates had limited experience or could not recall information from the required practical tasks. They also overlooked the importance of the command words being used. The command words being used in the questions, that is. Successful candidates could recall facts whilst applying their understanding to new and complex situations. I ought to sing that line, really, because I'm going to come back to that again and again. It's such an important part. part. It comes up again and again in examiners' report, uh, reports that students sometimes struggle to apply understanding to new situations, understanding that they learned in one context, applying it to a different context. It's the thing that students often struggle to do. Responses to the longer questions showed that the less able students tend to struggle when assembling a logical description. So I'm going to ask you another question now to, uh, again, put your thoughts into the, in, into the chat, please. What are the implications for teaching and learning arising from that feedback from the examiner's reports? In other words, what, what, what impact ought it to have on what, how we teach and how, how we uh, arrange the learning of our students as a result of that feedback? I'll go back to that slide so you can see the feedback on screen whilst you're trying to answer it. What are the implications for teaching and learning which arise from this feedback? And once again, I'll stay quiet for a few moments while you have an opportunity to um, put your thoughts into the chat. What impact could this have on our teaching and learning? Okay, just picking up on some of the comments coming in. For May, perhaps teachers should integrate the practical sessions or learning objectives into the course in a way where it's not seen as a checklist practical to be done, but rather to understand the science and logic behind it. Absolutely, I would agree with that. I think whilst I think there's been a shift in how we use experimental work as physics teachers, particularly away from what are the students doing with more of a focus now on what are the students learning? So the things we should be asking ourselves as teachers all the time while we're planning uh, um, experimental activities or teaching practical lessons is not what is it the students, the students are doing, but what are they learning? How do I know what students are learning in this activity? Mohammed has said, as a teacher, I would focus more on those topics about which the examiner said the students face difficulty in applying the idea on extended situations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When I first started teaching, I often used to think these examiner's reports were written for somebody else, you know, the school's exams officer or my head of department or something. And it was only when I was later in my teacher career that I realised, actually, there's gold dust in there. It's really important information for me as a classroom teacher because it's saying exactly what Mohammed has just suggested. It shows where students face difficulty, which are the t topics they find difficulty with, where should I be spending more of my time making sure they don't have those difficulties. 
Lakshmi has said doing practical can help students relate to the topic more and apply the learning on extended situations. Yeah, and that can be true. It doesn't have to always be a fully a full assess practical. It doesn't have to be a full practical lesson. Sometimes a short 10 minute activity or a short practical can be really good at getting into students heads. This is how this situation works. And sometimes that can be a quick demonstration, a quick practical activity or a quick measurement. It doesn't always have to be a full practical. You can have a lot of small practical activities and it really helps students, particularly students who struggle with abstract thinking to see the thing happening in, in practice. Sultan Amin has said, I think from the following theme, we should train the students not, not to be limited to memorizing how the questions are being given in previous question papers, but to analyze and give conclusions. Yeah. Teach them how to analyze questions and command words in the question. I think the command words thing is absolutely essential. I know I'll be mentioning it in tomorrow's session on assessment as well. Uh, but it's really important that students recognize how important the command word is in the question it, because the, the key is not what is the question about, what the topic is it about, but what is the question asking me to do? And the command word is key to that. Absolutely. Focus more on questions out of the box so the students can try to practice to use content they've studied in a different question setting. Bang on. That's back to the thing I was highlighting and singing earlier on, isn't it? Students really struggle to apply learning from one context to questions set in a different context. And you know it's going to happen. The examiners are required to ask questions which put the uh, question in a different context. So you know these questions are going to come up. So it's really important to get students to practice to be able to apply content learned in one way to a question in a different context. Exactly the example you've given now, the question that was shown earlier was a clear waves question, but could be used in astronomy. So it's applying one context learning Doppler effect in sound to a similar situation, but using light waves. Definitely ensuring that students understand and recognize differences between command words. The big one for me is the difference between describe and explain. If students answer an explain question with a describe answer, they're always going to lose 50% of the marks because they haven't done an explanation. They haven't said the because part. So it's essential that students understand what the command words mean and they tackle the command word that's in the question and have the ability to link the command word with the number of marks assigned for the question. Yep, spot on. Junaid said, objective of the experiment must be emphasized. Yeah, and get students to talk about why are they doing this experiment? What are they trying to find out? What is this experiment showing me? What am I trying to learn that I didn't know before? So the objective must be emphasized and it can be carried out in an interactive way. Formative assessment helps inculcating the in-depth understanding of the topic. I truly believe that most students will learn the content better when they have an understanding of how it applies in a practical situation. Thank you so much for those uh, contributions. Thank you. And I enjoyed them so much, I'm gonna ask you another one. And it's this. Astrophysics is probably one of the new topics in the, if you're new to this specification, that's probably one of the topics that you might not have seen in a previous specification that you were doing. And when students see the specification, astrophysics and astronomy or space, might sound really exciting to students and sometimes it sounds more exciting than it is because famously and you will know this as a teacher there are a few obvious practical opportunities and as we've just been talking about students are motivated and energized and engaged by active learning including practical science there are no core practicals listed in the astronomy topic the astrophysics topic and even if you have access to a telescope or binoculars you may well be in a learning environment where students are not in school during the hours of darkness. I said this on one session I was leading and one of the delegates said to me, actually, I teach at an international school, which is just behind the mountains in Myanmar. And we can absolutely go out onto the mountain in the dark and do live astronomy. And all I can say to that is fantastic. I wish I was in that position. But for many, many of us, we don't have the students in school during the hours when they're dark. And whilst you can do some astronomy on the sun, obviously you can never ever look at the sun through telescope or binoculars. So you're restricted in what practical astronomy you can do during the hours of daylight. So what I want to do is invite you to share activities that you might use or that you have used successfully in the past with students 
when teaching aspects of the space topic? What learning activities would you include when teaching the astronomy topic? As before, I'll stay quiet for a few minutes while people put their thoughts into the chat box, please. What activities have you found useful when teaching space, solar, solar system, astronomy, all those sorts of things? Trip to an observatory? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. If it's an observatory near to you or a planetarium, that can be really, really good. Videos are certainly a possibility, and I know we, we very heavily, there's some excellent videos available on, on YouTube, other platforms are available, but yeah, there are some really good um, videos available. I don't know how you found it. I find the excitement value of video has gone down during my teaching career. When I first started teaching, you could roll out a video and it's instant total concentration by students. Students are so used to seeing things on video now that it's sort of lost some of its wow factor, I think. But if it, there's still some good videos, and as long as you're, I can no longer put on a half hour video and think students are going to be uh, entertained and educated for that period of time or even engaged, but you can do short clips and it can work really well. We can use ring like objects to represent the orbits of planets and moons. Yep, good one. Virtual space exploration. There's some really good programs online, a, various, a variety of places. Utilize online resources and virtual reality experience to take students on virtual space exploration tours, visiting planets, moons, and other celestial bodies. As it's a new topic for me, I would kind of attempt to turn it into a flipped classroom where students are doing some of the learning beforehand and bringing that in, gathering information for students about the areas of interest for the students. I guess that's true for many of us because many of us may not have had experience of learning this topic in our own physics education, let alone teaching it to students. So it's well worth considering what activities we might include within it. Yeah, thank you for that. One practice is the trampoline experiment that they usually use to explain space time. Yeah, where you put weight in the middle and roll the ball around it, so I think. Yeah, that, that, yeah, good one. <laughs> wow is right. I like wow. I think bringing wow into the lessons is a good idea. Videos, balloon expansion for expansion of galaxies, simulations, diagrams. <laughs> Excuse me. An activity I've used, I mean, you want to be able to also do low tech activities, don't you? There's some really good ones there. And the trip to an observatory or a planetarium can, can be excellent. You also want to bring in some low tech activities and smaller activities. Making sundials can be really good in terms of getting students' heads around the relationship between the movement of the body we're on, the Earth, and the moon and the sun. So, you know, making sundials can be a, can be a good um, activity. Did one activity making um, toilet paper so, um, solar systems. Sounds odd, but bear with me. Making a solar system on a toilet paper. What students often struggle with is the, the sizes. You can get diagrams in good textbooks. They've all got them. You'll have posters with them on. There are diagrams showing the relative sizes of the planets compared to each other. Massive Jupiter, tiny Mercury, and so on. And you'll also have diagrams which show their relative orbits. But of course, the scales of both those are hugely different. And if students have only seen the diagram that's on the poster or in the textbook, they will often confuse and think the planets are much closer together than they are or much bigger than they are. You know, so the yeah. So looking at the combine the difference between the sizes and distances between them, the orbit of the planets um, can be quite difficult on a toilet paper. You use, you use the toilet roll and you say that one sheet of the toilet roll is equivalent to one astronomical unit. In other words, the length of one sheet of the toilet paper is one astronomical unit, the distance from the sun to the earth. And they then, on a toilet roll, draw the position of the planets in the solar system. So obviously Earth goes on the first set of uh, um, perforations and Mercury and Venus are on the first sheet of paper. Mars is about one and a half sheets further on than Earth, but then they place Jupiter and Saturn and the outer planets 
and Neptune is something like 20 or 30 sheets further out. So you're rolling out across the whole floor of the laboratory. And it's really good in getting into students' minds why it's possible to see Venus and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn with a naked eye because they're close enough or big enough to be seen. But to see Neptune or to see Uranus and so on, you need you need a telescope because they're so far away, even though they're big. And it gets an idea of the size, a really simple, cheap way of getting sizes. When we've done it, we then blue tacked the toilet paper solar systems up on the wall. And it's really good to keep referring back to when we're talking about the size of space with an able group. Once they've done their solar system on the toilet paper, you can then say, OK, how many sheets to the first star? And we're not talking sheets and it's a number of rolls, of course, it's much, much further. And just in terms of getting the sizes, the relative sizes into students' I, um, minds, it, it can be really useful. Tanada said, understanding the moving galaxies by using balloons, putting dots. When we blow air, the dots moving away. Yeah, really good. Using the NASA, web, NASA website, which brings me on to what I want to say next, which is that there is support available. You don't have to make this all up yourself. A deeper dive into the resources that are available on the Pearson subject website during session three will include a link to this booklet, which is freely downloadable. It's the International GCSE Physics Topic Guide Astrophysics, recognising the fact that many, student, many teachers struggle to find practical activities. There's a topic guide which includes some of these. As I say, it's freely downloadable from the website and it has a, a, a guidance on a few activities itself, but it also includes some links to good websites where downloadable student teaching and learning activities are provided. I've shown a few of these on the slide. The Association for Astronomy Education, AAE, is the website there. The NASA website is excellent, some really good high quality resources on, on space, both videos and, and, and images and tables of, of, of data. RAS website, Royal Association for Astronomy, uh, sorry, Royal Astronomical Society website. The leaflet on gravity relates directly to this topic and there's a website link there. I'd also point you to the Institute of Physics IOP website. It has invaluable resources and a wealth of student activities on this topic and other topics, which are freely available online and downloadable to support physics teachers. So there is help out there. Don't feel you've got to make it all up by yourself. Okay, the next thing I want to ask you is about planning lessons. How do you plan your lessons in physics? Do you, for example, have a common lesson structure as a starting point, which might be a structure that's laid down by your department or by your school, or, or it might be your own common le lesson structure? Are there any ways you might need to adapt your method of lesson, lesson planning to deliver this specification that we're talking about today? So just a few moments silence again for people to put in the chat room. What methods do you use to plan your lessons? Do you have a common blank form that you fill in or do you start with a blank sheet of paper and plan your lessons? I'm assuming you do plan your lessons. What, you know, what method do you use for planning? Let's just make this a fairly short activity, then we'll move on to the other information. Janeta said there's a template by the department. It's flexible for adding in details. Lesson plan I do is on that template. Yeah, I think that can be really useful. Uh, sometimes I think people find it, think it's restrictive when a department lays down a plan, but it can be really, really useful. In our school, we plan the lesson the way we like, so it's flexible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that when that's the case, I think it's useful to think for yourself whether or not you need to make yourself a sort of template. I mean, the reason I think a template can be helpful is that you don't have to fill in all the boxes. It's not an application form for something. You, you can choose to use the 
the boxes or the areas as, as you wish but it it reminds you to touch all the bases if on there you know you've got boxes for what activities are the students going to do what questions might i ask what are my what are my aims what's the prior learning what did we learn in previous lessons that relates to this how does this lesson's learning fit into the bigger picture of the topic and just thinking of those things in lesson planning can be really helpful in ensuring that we're touching all the bases, that all the students with different learning styles and strengths and different levels of needing extension or needing support are all covered. So it can just be a reminder to think, OK, how am I going to get this difficult concept across to students of differing abilities within my within my room? Next, we said we have objective, starter activity, prompting question on the topic, and then the topic discussion or activity. It was some way into my teaching career when I realised how useful it was to actually plan some of the questions I would ask. Not every question I would ask in the lesson, but planning some of the questions that I'd be asking students. And, you know, actually write them out at this bit situation, in the at this point in the lesson, I'll ask this named student this question. And it builds in questions that tackle higher order thinking skills. Because if you just make up the questions off the spur of the moment, or off the top of your head at the, in the time, they often tend to be lower order questions, questions that you can answer with yes, no, 42, that kind of answer. If you want students to think more deeply and answer questions in more detail, sometimes writing those questions down in advance can be really helpful. A flexible template based in the topic demand helps. I say it can be really useful if the departments sort of think about the lesson plan it can really help support one another because of course then you can share lesson plans and share good ideas and not necessarily just copy them but share good ideas so this this has really worked in a lesson this one fell flat i wouldn't use this one you know and, and it can be a really good baseline for for sharing teaching and learning ideas which i think department meters meetings should about to should too often we devolve into just discussing admin things at department meetings, whereas what we should really be spending time doing is talking about what really matters, what's happening in the classroom. So we've got one last uh, plan here, basic plan outline, introduce the topic, explain specific point, demonstrate, might be video or other, students solve past paper questions, different one from Janae, starter activity, brainstorming, teacher's exposition, methodology, activities, plenary, reflections by students. Yeah. There isn't a right answer to this, really, but as, as I say, I think it is useful to at least consider whether you should either have a combined plan, a shared plan, or even your own plan. I think it be use. I think it can be more useful than just a blank sheet because it reminds you not it, because you'll end up with the plan in your head if you're not careful, and it ends up being the same plan every time. Is is what I'm saying? Or there's a danger of it going that way. So saying these are the priorities for my planning can be really helpful. Starter introduction lesson episode one quick questioning lesson episode two quick check solved examples exam style questions plenary yeah yeah really good it's always good to apply the concepts to exam type questions absolutely agree and also relate to daily life problems I think it can be really useful when students have just done a practical activity whether that's a core practical or just a, a, a general everyday practical to follow it up with a question from of an exam type, even a part question, which tackles that, that learning so that students get used to thinking, how might I be asked about this sort of practical learning, the learning from this practical activity in an exam situation? Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. Let's go on and have a look at support and resources that are available. OK, there's support available. This just lists in a tabular form uh, freely available support that we have. So getting started guides, training events, subject advisor support, community forums, schemes of work, skills mapping, sample assessment materials, examiner reports, exemplar marked responses, past papers, exam wizard, mark schemes, results plus mock exam ex analysis, results plus access to script service. If you log into the session three of these, these uh, Welcome to Pearson sessions, we go in a bit more detail into the different types of freely available support that's available on the website and from uh, subject advisors. But here's just a sort of summary of the sort of things that you can find or ask for from uh, freely available from the board. And a number of resources available on the website 
you can see here there's a screenshot of the website um, and where the arrow is pointing there towards course materials you can see that um, on the live website these will be hyperlinked so you could click on to specification and sample assessments exam materials you see the 124 of those available so you click on that it leads you onto the next page teaching and learning materials so you can click on through the links and find them and there's a page like this for every subject but since we're here discussing physics here's the international gcse physics head page and you can see that there are links to these various documents that you can download freely from the website the teaching and learning materials can be a really useful place to look particularly if you're tackling a topic for the first time that's where you'd find things like the astronomy topic uh, teaching guide but also other resources which can be really useful and we're continually adding to this bank of materials so it is worth going back and having a look how do i make sure i cover all the content this is an introduction to the following few slides of the areas to be considered by teachers in ensuring full coverage of the content we need to think about specification about lesson plans which we've just been discussing about schemes of work and year planners here's a screenshot of the first part of the two-year course planner which is included in the getting started guide the course planner is also available as a Word document at the same location online, making it easy to edit and fit into your own needs. The planner gives one way of approaching the content, so this is all covered during the time available. Of course, you'll need to adjust that time to fit your own school's timetable because every school has its own unique set of how long a lesson is, the number of contact hours you get per week, and whether the school de uh, delivers the GCSE over two years or three years or some other time period, some schools start their GCSE some way through year nine. So you'd need to adjust it and you can do so because it's a Word document, you can easily cut and paste and adjust it to your own timing. This is based on the linear course, all assessed at the end. So there's flexibility about which order the topics are taught in. If you're later on following a modular course, obviously you'd need to link all the parts within the module that you're aiming towards uh, within one time. As we mentioned before, the order of topics that are in the specification and in this example course planner are not intended to suggest that this is the only order in which you can teach the topics or even the best order in which to deliver the content. You'll need to decide for yourself which topic you want which topic you want to start with and how you want to move on sorry it was someone speaking then i heard a, a microphone click no okay yeah sorry and because it's an editable as i say it's in word format in this case in the microsoft excel uh, format it's very easy to cut and paste and put them in the order that you want to you can see that each of the topics has the number of hours per topic listed there. So you know in your own uh, context how many lessons that's going to need to cover to cover it. But it's really useful, I think, to have a course planner laid out because particularly either if you're new to teaching or new to teaching a new specification for you, uh, it's really easy to put absolutely everything into the early topics and then find yourself at the end of the fifth term in year 11 with half the course still to do that's exaggerating but you know what i mean you can run out of time if you're not careful because of putting and it's important to sort of plan out the whole timing not because you have to stick to it rigidly things get in the way you know illnesses school trips all these sorts of things can get in the way of the plan but it, it's a thing to be sort of working from and to move back to so that you don't run out of time to teach the later topics just a mention of results plus Results Plus is a tool that teachers find e extremely useful in analysis of their students and their own teaching performance. Using Results Plus, you can see in-depth data on the performance of a candidate, a class, or a whole school in reference to the whole cohort, whether it's the whole world or the cohort in and the country in which you're working. And teachers can use this to see which questions and specification points students have performed well in and poorly in and use this in their choices around revision, resets, and future classroom teaching. Results Plus is freely available to every school and centre that's entering students for, for any Edexcel specification. 
It's a really useful resource. Just a brief outline of how it works. It was developed, Result Plus, in 2007 when Pearson at Excel looked at how it could modernise its exam marking process and brought over EPEN marketing technology, actually, from the United States. So students take their exam in a traditional paper-based way, as they always did. They get a paper and they write on it you know, using a pen. But rather than those papers being bundled up and sent off to a marker, instead they're sent first to a central processing centre and they're scanned in through a series of machines. Electronic copies of their students' answers are then sent electronically, emailed, to examiners. And this means that particular questions from the same paper can be sent to different examiners to uh, depend on their expertise. So one student's paper might be being marked by seven or eight different markers specialising in their own question. And they're marked on a screen digitally. That then provides an enormous amount of rich digital data which goes back to produce the student's grades, but also is consolidated, consolidated into this central system, which you can access under Results Plus. It allows you to see by specification point, for example, how the students in your school are doing compared to other students on that same question. And really it tells you where the bodies are buried in your teaching and learning. You can see you know, which are the topics you're teaching really well, the topics where your students tend to be doing better than the average, or, um, you know, means you're teaching those areas really well. You don't need to spend lots of time revising the way in which you teach that. It's working. Instead, you can focus your time on improving how you teach those topics where your students are doing less well than other students. So it's a really good area for departmental development and individual teacher development. It tells you where your teaching is working and where it isn't and so it can really help to focus uh, school development. Let me just mention another tool that's also free to all centres entering students for any edXL papers. It's Exam Wizard, and it's a tool that teachers find useful in producing exercises and past papers for students for use for study or in uh, classroom tests. It uses questions from past papers so the bank of potential questions increases with it. each time there's a new series of papers, it's added to the bank. So there's an increasing bank of questions. And it means you can produce bespoke questions or question papers, depending on what teachers are selecting to test. And again, as I say, in the shorter module three, where we're looking in some depth at the support available, I can go through in more detail on how this works. It's a really useful resource to be able to produce not just mock papers, but homework questions, end of topic tests, things like this, that you can use which are based on exam questions or part exam questions. And you know that you're asking questions which are marked at the same level that they would be in a final exam. The access to script service, again, is a free online portal and it allows teachers to access electronically marked exam papers. So on the day that the marks come out in August, you can access your own students' marked papers free of charge. It's available free for all qualifications and is accessed through Edexcel Online. So the scripts don't have examiner annotation on them, but it does have marks question by question. At the moment, Pearson Edexcel is the only awarding organisation to offer this service free of charge. You can use the access to script service alongside Results Plus that I just mentioned, and using them together can help you identify topics and skills where your students could benefit from further learning, helping them to gain a deeper understanding of the subject. Find out more about the access to the script service by going online and having a look at the um, user guide that takes you through the process step by step. You can access the scripts and read them on screen, or you can download them as PDF files if you want to use them. Mention of an additional resources that's available, uh, curricula match student books with active books are available and teaching hubs. And so these are paid for resources that you can add as well. And if you want to find out more about those, uh, look online at the event, at the information or contact the um, subject advisor. Pearson Publish resources. These are designed for anyone following the latest Pearson Edexcel International GCSE teachers and learners who want the best preparation for exam success and progression to A-level, international A-level, international baccalaureate diploma and BTEC. They're specifically developed for international learners. 
for the globally recognized nine to one grading system. Each student book provides three year access to an active book, a digital version of the student book, which can then be accessed online. When they, you get the book, there's a code inside it so students can access uh, the digital version, which gives them access to interactive uh, resources. Biology, chemistry and physics are supported by the new Teaching Hubs platform, which is designed to save teachers time and help them deliver high quality lessons. Online teacher resource packs provide further planning, teaching and assessment support, both for the single science award and double science award resources. And each of them embed transferable skills which are needed for progression to higher education and employment. And they're reviewed by a language specialist to ensure that the book, each of the books are written in a clear and accessible style. Um, you'll be aware, obviously, that Pearson is a publisher as well as being an exam board. Uh, but I do need to add the rider that you don't have to buy Pearson textbooks in order to deliver a Pearson at Excel uh, specification. We believe they're good and they cover the content well, but you don't have to. If you've taught a previous um, specification, a different specification, and you've got some resources, some textbooks some worksheets that you're really happy with, you don't have to drop them all in the skip if you switch to an at Excel, you, as long as you check that they're covering the content at the right level, you can continue to use resources that you're that you're happy with. Spend less time planning with schemes of work that break the international GCSE specification into hour long lessons, detailed lesson plans for each hour of teaching with time allocations to suit different uh, lesson length, as well as in depth teacher guidance. Uh, they can deliver great subject lessons with a wealth of front of class resources that are linked to the lesson plans, including interactive exercises, animations and videos, plus an overview uh, page containing all the top level information about the lesson, as well as links to the textbook. With lesson plans giving partially scripted instructions for communicating new learning points and correcting misconceptions and interactive exam prep resources, ideal to further illustrate complex concepts and consolidate learning. We believe that using the teaching hubs can, hubs can provide complete coverage of all guided teaching hours and can be used for live teaching as well as advanced preparation, which can save you planning time so you can spend more time teaching. I mentioned a couple of times during this session, uh, subject advisor. This is Irene, the science subject uh, advisor. She is an absolute goldmine of information about everything to do with the science specifications. And she is your go to person to find out anything, any questions about the specification or changes within it. If she doesn't know the answer herself, and in my experience, she does know 80% of them. If she doesn't know the answer herself, she will direct your question to someone who does. She will know someone within the exam board who does. So please, um, as I said, we'd, we'd, we'd always give you details of our subject advisor at the end of the presentation, but it seems fitting that we mention Irene here. It's very easy to contact Irene. You can see the contact uh, um, there, the email, or directly through the website. And if she can't get back to you immediately, she'll respond as, as soon as she can. Um, it's well worth, I think, signing up to the email update service that Irene and the other subject advisors offer that you submit your email and she will automatically include you in any issues about changes or relative uh, date changes or information changes to specification. Obviously the content of the specification doesn't change on a regular basis, but details, administrative detail, deadlines, all these sorts of things can. It was really, really useful during the time when the pandemic was uh, sweeping the world with COVID-19 and different areas had different exam uh, conditions imposed upon them because of the regulations for when people could be together or not. It was really, really useful to keep people updated as to what were the current regulations and date changes and coursework deadlines and all these things were changing on a regular basis and save people having to keep scouring the website to think, am I still doing what I thought I was doing? The email update was, was used to do that. And you can sign up to the email update, update simply by contacting Irene and asking you to put her on her, on her list. So really useful uh, resource. 
Is ATS also available for AS physics? Sorry, what do you mean by the ATS? I'm sorry. Access to script. Sorry. Yes, is the answer. Yes. Okay. We've come to the kind of formal end of today's presentation. I hope you're going to be able to join us for tomorrow, where we look in some depth at the assessment, the different types of questions, that the ways in which the uh, physics course is assessed and, and how we prepare students towards those different types of assessment. But we've kind of finished the formal part of today's session. So just before I go, I'm going to ask, invite you, you don't have to share this, but to think of three things you might try or do differently as a result of ideas that you've discussed today. So just review in your head things that we've covered today. Are there any things you want to look at more? And I would invite you to share in the chat box one thing that you'd like to do as soon as you return to your classroom or department. So one thing we've talked about today that you might want to try out for yourself or find out a little bit more about. And we have a little bit of time left. So I'm going to, as I say, finish the formal part of the session, but stay open for a while for any questions that you might want to put into the chat. Uh, and I'll try to answer those questions as best I can. If you don't have any questions, I would say you're free to leave and sign out now and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And I hope, as I say, that you're able to join us again for tomorrow's session on assessment. Uh, but thank you very much in either case for joining us. And so I will stay online for a little while to try and pick up any questions that people might have.